Lord God's children, because this is a day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Welcome to the Master's Touch worship service. You know, we're delighted to be able to bring these worship services to you to glorify God. And did you know that you should come expecting to receive? Why? Because if you don't come expecting to receive, you won't receive anything from God. So raise that expectation level. <clears throat> Get it up there really high. Now, as we begin our worship today, take a second and assemble a small piece of bread or a cracker and a, a um, swallow of some sort of beverage or juice. It can even be water. And then later on, we're going to pray over it, so set it aside, because we're going to sanctify it as the body and the blood of Christ. So let's begin by invert, invert, invertating, inviting. <laughs> let's begin by inviting the Holy Spirit to join us for our worship service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, open wide. And we're expecting to receive your word and revelation knowledge. Our love and devotion for you fall, flows freely from our lips and from our heart. And we love you, magnify you, adore you, and praise your holy name. We thank and praise you that we believers dwell in the secret place of the Most High, in Christ. And we thank you that you've heard our prayers as well. We rejoice because your word tells us that all of your answers for the believers' prayers are yes and amen. Hallelujah. We thank you for the gifts of utterance, the rhema word of God, and revelation knowledge. We thank you for our impartation. And we thank you for the healing power of God that's present to heal all who come to you in faith and in need. We give you thanks and praise for your only begotten Son and his finished work on the cross on our behalf. And we give you all the honor, all the glory, all the praise today. We thank you that we are healed and made whole and completely restored. In the name of Jesus Christ, our matchless name, the matchless name, that is, of, his, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, we pray and ask you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you don't know the songs <clears throat> as we begin our worship, then just listen to the words and let them minister to you as we worship and sing. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat>
of Christ in me From life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell, no scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his hands Till he returns or calls
could climb the highest heights, travel far beyond the sky. Even there, I know you'd find me with your love. I could cross the distant seas, walk through valleys dark and deep. Even there, I know you'd reach me with your love. Nothing can say. Nothing strong enough. Nothing can separate me. Nothing could ever take me, take me from your love, the love of Jesus. Not tomorrow. Enjoy your deepest pain. There is nothing that can keep from your love. Oh no, not in life or even death. Not one power of hell or heaven. For I know you'll always find me with your love.
Stop what you're doing, pull up a chair, and get ready to receive. We've entered God's presence with praise and thanksgiving, and now as we dwell in God's presence, I just want you to embrace the sweetness of the Holy Spirit, bask in His presence, and open your hearts to receive Him. Soak with me. My friends, the power for God's Word and His miracles always follows the Word of God. So the power is in the Word. And that's exactly where we're going next, deep into the Word of God. So, Father, let your words be my words and my words be yours. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Now remember that because we're entering into the throne room presence of God, we must always be prepared to be in that glorious presence. So in order to go deeper into the Spirit and worship, you must soak in worship. And that's the door. All right, and that's what we were just doing, and just want you to know that. Now, because we've moved deeper into spiritual knowledge and the wonders of God, we see that it's taking us into our spiritual nature and makeup. So this morning, I want to talk with you about the qualifications for authority. You know, it's been pointed out more than once in this study that the authority of which we've been speaking is the property of every single believer. It's not a special gift imparted in answer to prayer, but the inherent right of the child of God because of his elevation with Christ to the right hand of the Father. Now he's become, through the rich mercy of God, an occupant of the throne of the Lord. Think about that. With all that it implies of the privileges and responsibility. Especially responsibility. You know, it's not easy to be a born-again believer. <laughs> You get responsibility along with it. <clears throat> now, this elevation took place at the resurrection of the Lord, and because of the believer's inclusion in Him, the elevation is holy of the wisdom and grace of the Father. 
You see, we don't climb the heavenly steps by any act of faith or devotion on our part. It's ours simply to recognize the fact of this position and to take our place in humble acceptance, giving all the glory and honor to God. So let's recall our, just the four words which were previously mentioned. They are, to usward who believe, now this is from last week, from usward, uh, to usward who believe, in the former reference we emphasize the first two pointing out that all the demonstration of the omnipotence of God in Christ pointed manward, in other words, towards us as believers. And we're going to now look at the last two words, to usward who believe, it's not enough that the divine fullness of God outpours without impediment, <laughs> supplies to us, there must be a receptive heart and an attitude on our part in order to receive the gifts. So a bottle could be submerged in waters of a fountain, but if the cork's removed, the holder may wait indefinitely and in the end carry it away empty. So <clears throat> just as this example states, multitudes of truly spiritual believers are completely immersed in the presence of God and it presses them on every side. And there's a longing for its experience and that belief that it should be theirs and a readiness to receive. And these things are the witness of their spirits to the truth which the Holy Ghost has unfolded in their word, in the word. And yet, because their minds have been unrenewed, as they have read the word, the, the simplicity and the glory of this truth have not dawned on them, then we need to continually pray with deep heart humility that the eyes of our mind may be enlightened. Belief. To us, usward, to us, us, to usward, <laughs> who believe. This is what it says. Few comprehend the primary thought of belief. You know, it's a twofold meaning, bursting with deep significance. In it are combined two old Anglo-Saxon words: be, to live or exist, and uh, life and, which conveys the thought of agreement and cooperation. That, therefore, to believe means literally to live in agreement and cooperation with, accustomed to. So belief. Uh, a simple uh, mental assent is what it is with some particular truth. But its root leads us on to action, okay? And that which the mind accepts, the will must obey. We don't truly believe unless our conviction is manifested in our life. And therefore understood, belief stands on a par with faith, which is its deeper sense. It means not only to have trust in a person, but to manifest that trust by practical commitment. That's why I say to you, it's not that we believe God, because we do believe in God. You know, we believe in God, but we believe God. We have to believe what he says, believe he exists, believe that he says what he says, and it means the truth. Do we believe that God has quickened us together with Christ and has raised up to get us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? Well, if we do, our reaction to it will be a fervent, Lord, I accept your gracious word. I believe that you have given me this gift. In humble faith, I do now take my seat in the heavenly places in Christ at your right hand. So teach me how to fulfill this sacred ministry, how to exercise the authority which you have entrusted to me. Train me day by day that I may grow in the full stature of the perfect man in Christ, so that in me your purpose of the ages may be fulfilled. Amen. Now, if we're walking in the Spirit, our normal life is in the heavenlies. To make sure that we totally understand this, there has to be the daily acceptance of that fact. So let's, uh, morning by morning, as one of our first acts of worship, take our seat with Christ, as suggested in the previous paragraph, and return thanks to God for all that it implies. Let's uh, often remind ourselves that we're seated far above all the powers of the air. Take authority over that devil. And that they are, all those powers are in the heavenlies and under our feet are in subjection to us. As our faith learns to use the name and the authority of Jesus, we'll find the spiritual forces yielding obedience in ways that will surprise us. As we continue to abide closely in Him, our prayers for the advancement of the uh, kingdom, God's kingdom, will become less and less uttering of petitions and will increasingly manifest the exercise of a spiritual authority that recognizes no national boundaries but fearlessly binds the forces of darkness in any part of the world. And what we will end up doing is be giving thanksgiving continually to God for all he's given to us and done for us and is able to give us the power to do for him. Now, while belief introduces us to our place of throne power, only humility will ensure our gaining and retaining it. As we compare the abounding grace of God and our own utter worthly, unworthiness, <laughs> unworthlessness, <laughs> the question arises, should we need such a warning as this? Hey, 
Praise God, it becomes less necessary as the soul grows in grace and the likeness of the sun increases in us. But you know what? We know very little of the plague of our own hearts. Come on. If we think of the danger that, that, and we think the danger is all over, we are so wrong. The forces against whom we contend, the principalities and powers, the world rulers of this darkness, the hosts of wicked spirits in the heavenlies, they know us far better than we know ourselves, folks. As we attack them, the authority is not but a long, drawn-out warfare against them. Their return attack is often swift and crushing. We may crumble with the blow, but we are not defeated. With a strategy gained in long experience in spiritual battles, they know that the, be the, the offensive is their best mode of defense, and one of their tested weapons is spiritual pride, and too often it proves very effective. Now, victory over the powers of the air from the Dread Prince downwards is demonstrated possibility, but its attainment is alone through the employment of divine aid, and by that I mean stand up for who you are in Christ. Step into the knowledge of who you are and, and start to exercise the power that's been given you, and you won't, want to, you won't want to exercise the power that's been given to you until you know what that power is, and you won't know that if you don't know who, you're in, you, who you are in Christ. Now, since Eden, man has forgotten that God is essential. Through the intervening of the ages, as you can see plainly in today's dates, of what's going on in the world, uh, he has constantly sought to show himself self-sufficient, man has, and Christ was the first of all of our race that ever cast himself fully upon God. He trusted in God, let him deliver him, was the sneer of the enemy at Calvary, but at Calvary, the one who had thus fully trusted could not be delivered. He must go down to death, for the sin question of the world was involved, and the shedding of his precious blood was necessary for the final and once and for all atonement. So he was crucified through weakness, 2 Corinthians 13, 4. When this was accomplished, nothing more stood in the way. God raised him from the dead and stripped his foes of all of their authority, set him on high over them. With believers, the consuming desire to be independent is something which even the regenerate heart doesn't fully o overcome. Oftentimes, just after some uh, significant victory has been gained, there comes the subtle whisper of the enemy. And the overcomer is swiftly shorn of strength and through the through feeling that he is strong. You know, he's I mean, just feels he's completely uh, invincible and finds out that he isn't. <laughs> One swift blow from the enemy and he's punched the air out of your out of your lungs and you crumble up like an old wrinkled up rag. But with profound humility, there may go, however, the div the greatest boldness in the name of Christ. True boldness is faith in full manifestation, folks. And when God has spoken, to hold back is not humility, but unbelief. So don't go there. Be humble, but don't draw back away from God. Don't go into unbelief. In the exercise of authority, there is needed a divine courage that fears nothing but God and reaches out strong hands to bind and to restrain all that is contrary to him. Step up there and stand up for, the, for your, your creator. But with this courage... <coughs> With this courage, there must be a continual and close abiding in God, a spirit that is alert to every urge and check from him. Be aware. And, the, and a mind that is steeped in the word of God. Stick in that word. I, I tell all my students, get back in that word. Stay in the word. What does the word say about it? Whenever there's something coming against you, go to the word. There's nothing that will ever uh, come to you in this life that isn't covered in the word of God. Now, in order to get a full understanding, there's a subject that we have to talk about and, that, and to understand, and that's fear. The heavenlies, while they're play, uh, the place of every spiritual blessing, are also the place of the most intense conflict. Let the believer, whose eyes have been opened to the reality and the total comprehension of his throne rights in Christ, definitely accept his seat and begin to exercise the spiritual authority which that position has given him. You see, when the believer does that, he quickly realizes that he's a marked man. <laughs> Whereas, in his previous stand in ministry, he may have firmly believed in the presence and working of the powers of darkness and oftentimes even earnestly prayed against them. But there comes now a new consciousness of their existence and imminence. Principalities and powers, demons and the devil's cohorts bitterly resent and resist the believer's entrance into their domain and the believer's interference with their workings. Implacable and malignant, they concentrate their hatred against him in an intense warfare, in which there is no end. If attacks against his spirit are successfully resisted, assaults may come in mind or body or family or circumstance. The place of special privilege therefore becomes a place of special danger. 
You know, there is no truth that encounters such opposition in its presentation as the testimony of those who have brought it forward by the voice or pen. You know, we believers uh, write books telling about our experiences. We speak out in testimony in churches and, and we travel around like missionaries and give the word of God and talk about our own experiences. And I do that too. And we've even known ministers and heard of ministers and missionaries who have taught these truths with acceptance, who have actually been overthrown in spirit or in body, and their ministries were rendered useless. Yet since God himself, with an eternal purpose in view, has introduced his people into this sphere, so we can't doubt that full provision has been made for their safety or our safety. And I'm going to tell you why. Because when you're in Christ, you're blended with Christ. You're fused together with him, and nothing can ever separate you. Your cells, you're born through him, born again through him, and so all of your cells, all of your tissues, every atom and molecule that makes you up is now bone of Jesus' bone, flesh of his flesh, atom of his atom, molecule of his molecule. You are Christ-empowered. Uh, you are Christ-fused together. You're blended together. You are one in him and with him. You are born through him, and you come out with his DNA. All right? So nothing by any means can hurt you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. So the only place of safety is the occupation of that seat that we've been given itself. Remember, it is far above the enemy. If the believer abides steadfastly by faith in this location, in Christ, he cannot be touched. Consequently, the enemy puts forth all of his wiles to draw him down in spirit. Why? Because once out of his seat, his authority is gone, and he's no longer dangerous. And further, he's wide open to attack. At this point, we see the meaning in the message of maintaining our place against the wiles of the devil. In order to do that, the believer must be constantly arrayed in full armor. How do you get that armor on? It doesn't tell you in the Bible. It says put on, but it doesn't tell you you ever take it off. How do you put it on? Does it give you instruction? Sure. By becoming born again. When you come into Christ, you give Christ your life, you are born again through him, like I just told you, and now you are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. You wear his armor. He is the armor of God. Now, the different parts of this armor symbolize certain spiritual attitudes which a person has to maintain as a born-again believer. And it's most important to understand that the armor itself, when worn, if you're born again, constitutes the protection of the believer and not his activity against the foe, okay? Fully harnessed, he is fully kept and is unhampered in his ministry of authority. All that he needed or needs to do to be concerned about it at all is, like a good soldier, to keep his armor bright and well secured about him. Polish it, folks. <laughs> Practice it, you know? Uh, let's note briefly the meaning of the various parts of the panoply. No item can be omitted. Ready? There is one, the girdle of truth, the clear understanding of God's word, which, like a soldier's belt, holds the rest of the armor in place. Two, the breastplate of righteousness, not as often stated the righteousness of Christ, but rather the active obedience to the word which he has received. Three, the feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, a faithful ministry in the heralding of the word. And four, the shield of faith, turos, the large door-shaped shield covering the whole body, which indicates his complete refuge under the blood of Calvary, where no power of the enemy can penetrate. 5. The helmet of salvation, called elsewhere the hope of salvation, 1 Thessalonians 5.8. It is a remarkable fact that the hope of salvation, the coming of the Lord Jesus, is the only helmet that seems able to protect the head in these days of apostasy from the truth. 6. The sword of the Spirit, which shows the word of God used in an active sense, even as the girdle shows it in a defensive one, uh, then the uh, sort of uh, the word of God is the sort of truth, which is uh, coming out of our mouth against the enemy. It's used as our weapon. And seven, all prayer, the training of the faculties, Godward by constant approach to God. The emphasis in chapter uh, um, <clears throat> well, not chapter six. That's it from my lesson. Anyway, the emphasis in this message is laid on victory. Okay. I want you to note the following paraphrase, which brings out the full force of verse 13. Wherefore, take up with you the battle, the whole armor of God, to the battle, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to successfully withstand in the evil day, and having overthrown all foes, to remain unshaken. There's no suggestion of defeat here. Secure within his armor, the believer may disregard the enemy and give his entire attention to the exercise of the ministry to which he's been called. That 
of, of the purpose of God in his life. So go forward, my friends. If you're born again, go forward knowing who you are in Christ Jesus. You have the power to withstand the wiles of the devil. Don't go around succumbing to everything that he throws at you. They're just thoughts. And if you take that thought and begin to operate on it in fear, then you're defeated. So don't do that because we don't want to see that happen to anybody. Right now, if you desire to come into and dwell in the miraculous presence of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, if you desire to put him on, put that armor of God on, to be uh, blended with him and born through him, being one with him, to be in Christ, then you need to avail yourself of his marvelous wisdom, and you must give your life to him. It's very simple and pain-free, and in just a moment, I'm going to give you that opportunity.
come to know G <clears throat> Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, <clears throat> just repeat this prayer. Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner and surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me and set me free for all eternity from all my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead and sit at the right hand of God the Father. Take over my life and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I renounce the devil and all sin. Lord, I receive from you the gift of righteousness, total forgiveness of all my sins, past, present, and future, divine health, wholeness, and restoration, your protection, direction, your provision, your peace, and the gift of everlasting life. I'm yours. Come into my heart and take over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, then you're saved, and welcome to the family of God. Well, we're going to go right on into another uh, um, song right now, and I just want you to understand what this song represents, because it's uh, leading us into Holy Communion. When you listen to the words to this, <clears throat> excuse me, listen to what it says, because it explains Holy Communion to you, okay? Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us. And we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross. And so we share in this bread. Savior Jesus Christ tore for you. Eat and remember the wounds that heal, the death that brings us life. Paid the price to make us one.
I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I coughed and, and had a reflex for a second and shut the music off. Forgive me. Uh, one of the wonderful things that we receive from taking Holy Communion is healing of our bodies and our minds. And the issue with those who take Holy Communion and don't receive their healing through it is rooted in lack of knowledge. But we have to prepare before taking Holy Communion. The first thing we do is discern the body of Christ. And what does that mean? How do we do that? Well, by acknowledging that the bread or whatever you're using as the body of Christ is the vibrancy of the life of Jesus, his supernatural healing and wholeness, his attributes, his characteristics, uh, his power. And um, it's a creative power. And you could think of it as a pill because it's a small amount that's just glowing with the Shekinah glory of God and it's healing you as it travels down through your mouth and down into your body. And as it does that, it's pushing out all darkness, which is sickness and disease from the inside out. Now visualize the condition you're plagued with, the sickness or disease being on Jesus' body. Then put whatever the ailments are on him. Use your imagination. You're not giving him something he doesn't want. Remember, he already took it at the cross. So you were healed at the cross. Now you see the enemy's trying to trick you. He's trying to trick you into taking it. How? By deceiving you into thinking that you've got it. But since Jesus took it already at the cross, you're healed and made whole. Already. So put it right back on Jesus in the same place on him that you've been afflicted. In other words, see yourself with the solution. See yourself without the problem. And this is called spiritual visualization. There's a key to it, and here it is. Number one, visualize. Visualize yourself without the problem. And number two, meditate on what God's word says about it. In his word, he says that by his stripes you were healed. Then pray in tongues over it. Then decree, speak it out and speak out the revelation of your healing and restoration. Make your declaration out loud. It's vital you understand this and put it into practice in your lives. The next thing we do in preparation is discern the blood of Christ. We discern it as the forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future. The restoration of the blessing to your life, the power and the authority of God in your life in full operation. As receiving the gift of righteousness from Jesus Christ, thanking God for his plan of redemption, that you've been given eternal life, life everlasting, and now you no longer live under the law, but you live under his grace. Hallelujah. Now, lift up the elements of the covenant that I asked you to assemble at the beginning of the program. You lift it up before the Lord as I pray. Father, we praise you and worship you with these elements of the covenant. We thank you that your only begotten son, Jesus, gave his life sacrificially so that we may live and have life more abundantly. We thank you now as this bread becomes our portion of his healing body and the vibrancy of his life within us. We thank you that this, uh, as we partake of this body of the Christ, we become healed and made whole and completely restored. We thank you that this beverage becomes our portion of his cleansing blood, that we are continually washed in the waterfall of his blood and renewed within as we perpetually remember the act of love on, on the cross on his behalf, from him on our behalf. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, our Savior, our Lord, our Redeemer. Amen. You know, the Lord's Supper is a personal fellowship. It's a partnership with Christ. And partaking of one bread creates partnership between all of the members, the born-again believers, as well. It makes his body. It merges us into the one body, and that's called the church. The Word of God commands us, my friends, to eat the bread and drink the cup to perform that continually. Take the bread, give thanks, break it and eat it. Then take the cup, give thanks and drink it, all in the remembrance of Jesus Christ. And the com Lord commanded that the supper be repeated often. However, Paul doesn't really give us any instruction as to how frequently the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated, but he does imply that it's to be done with frequency so that partaking of the Lord's Supper continually recalls to our mind our redemption by Christ from all sickness and disease and all sin. So do it as often as you want to and need to. Now, as we're instructed, we discern the body and the blood of Christ as we prepare to partake. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for you, so that every cell, tissue, organ, and bone, all systems, neurological, blood vascular, lymphatic, muscular, skeletal, all are totally aligned with God's word and his will, and that you are and remain healed, made whole, and totally restored to divine health and wholeness. In the name of Jesus, our healer, the Christ. Amen. Partake of the body of our Lord and Savior. <coughs> In the same manner, 
He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you in celebration of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, for the remission of all of your sins, past, present, and future. In the name of Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior, the Christ, amen. Partake of the blood of our Lord and Savior. My friends, the Lord's Supper is a feast. If you've never been to a feast, you just have. It's a feast of living union of believers with the Savior, whereby we spiritually and by faith receive Christ with all of his benefits and are nourished with the vibrancy of his life into eternal life. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Now, one more thing. When we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, the Bible tells us that we are made a new creation or new creature in Christ Jesus, and the emphasis is on the in Christ Jesus. When we accept Christ as our Savior, we move into Him, and He surrounds us completely. And with that in mind, I want you to get this picture. We are in Him, and He is in us. Put Him on like you would a suit of clothes. Your hands into His like gloves, your arms into His like sleeves of a coat, your body into His body like a shirt, your legs into His like trousers, and your feet into His like shoes. Wherever you go, He goes. Wherever He goes, you go. As a result of this union, you're inseparable. All of the vibrancy of His life, all of His divine health and wholeness, all of His perfection are yours. He's in you and you're in Him. And like the caterpillar who moves into a chrysalis, and a great exchange happens, supernaturally, he comes forth as a butterfly, never, ever to be a caterpillar again. For the rest of his life, he'll remain a butterfly, and we too make a great exchange. When we accept Christ as our Savior and our Lord, we move into Christ. The difference between us and the caterpillars is huge. However, it's similar. I mean, it's, it's a good illustration. We are a new creation, but we remain in Christ for all of eternity. We never come out of him. So look at the New Testament. All the gifts and promises of God in the New Testament speak about us as being in Christ, Tell, <clears throat> telling us that we must be in Christ to re qualify to receive those gifts and promises. Well, we've also been given the mind of Christ. Your head goes into Christ's head. You're the head. You remain the head because the tail is no longer in the equation. You see, we're completely carried in Christ. Therefore, nothing evil can ever touch us. We can't be sick. Oh, sickness and disease can be offered to us. The enemy can try to get us to take it. How? By coming into agreement with it. Since Jesus went to the cross and triumphed over Satan, the devil no longer has any influence over you. The only thing that he can do th since then is to distract you, move your focus off the things of God into the, onto the cares of this world, and he's good at that. He's very, very good at that. And he can deceive you. He's the father of all lies and cunning in all of his deceptions. So here's the reality of it. Satan will always attack you where you lack knowledge of God's word. So if you lack knowledge of what God says about your healing, Satan's going to attack you in your health. If you lack knowledge in Christian finance, Satan will attack you in your finances. And those are the two that he always t attacks the most because that's where people are the weakest. His game plan is always the same, my friends. It never changes. Distraction and deception. So he can't give you anything. He has no power over you. Jesus stripped him of it. Listen to closely to this. The only thing that he can do is offer it to you. That's right. He can only offer it to you. You make the choice in your response. And I mean by that that do you accept the evil report? When you get an evil report about sickness and disease, do you agree with that? Or do you agree with what God's Word says about you and your healing in the Word of God? Do you acknowledge facts, that, that knowing that facts are subject to change, facts are in the natural, and everything in the natural was um, temporary? So do you accept those temporary things as, as the gospel, or do you accept what God's Word, which is unchangeable, unshakable, and forever eternal, what it says about you? I know you're saying to yourself, yeah, but I'm sick and I'm in pain. Well, that may be the case, but those are just lying symptoms, my friends. You see, the enemy always works from the outside in. God always works from the inside out. And where God is, the enemy can't be. We're not denying the symptoms. We're denying their right to be there. Now that we are in Christ, we are totally protected because we are in Christ. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 tells us that as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Well, how is he? He's perfect, full of, uh, of divine health and wholeness, full of the vibrancy of life, able to do miracles, full of confidence in God and his word and, and in himself and what he's able to accomplish for God. Listen, beloved, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Hallelujah. That belongs to you. 
Every morning, first thing, begin your day by thanking God for the finished work of Jesus on the cross and thank Him that you are in Christ. Throughout the day, as you think of it, give God glory for all He's already done for you and again, thank Him that you are in Christ. At night before you retire, give God thanks again for all He is and has done for you as your Savior and thank Him for the power of God that's in your body coming against all attacks of the devil, keeping you healed and whole and well. Thank Him again that you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, in Christ Jesus. Now raise your hands for the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord um, lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. May you open up your mouth and continually, de and continually declare who you are in Christ Jesus, thanking God for all that you've received, and give honor and glory and praise to the Lord Most High. May you glorify God with all of your thoughts, words, and deeds as the Lord continually blesses you with divine health and wholeness and makes your way prosperous as you walk in his love. I close today with this prayer. Dear Lord, into your hands I place my worries, cares, and troubles. Into your wisdom I place my uh, direction, pa uh, uh, the pa my path, <laughs> my direction, and my goals. Into your love I place my life, my entire life, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. God bless you as you go, and I'll uh, expect to hear from you this week.